Hi and welcome back to our Orboot, Rust and RISC-V hacking streams. So today I would like to take the chance and do a bit of a recap of everything that we've done over the last month. And I would like to get back to the final issue that we were trying to iron out last time, uh, which was getting SMP to work or symmetric multiprocessing. Because on the, uh, the board that we're working with, we actually have a multi-core SLC and so the issue is that um, if you want to be able to use both of these cores so that you can you know uh, like do parallel processing for example um, you actually need to be a bit careful with the firmware part so yeah, what we've been doing for now was we just essentially kept uh, one of the two cores spinning infinitely and so now the thing is when we are done with initializing firmware we need to get back to uh, this core just uh, running normally and also jump to the regular operating system. And that is something I've, uh, well, just fixed over the past few weeks. Um, so let's actually have a look at uh, what is happening now. So I will now power on the board and I will run the firmware as it currently is. So our orbit that is targeting the Vision 5.1. So we run our command, we just say make run we give it the port to run on, which is this FTTY ACM0 device here. And now it's uploading the firmware over to the device. Even though it's just 32K, uh, well, it takes a few seconds to transfer because it's a very, very slow connection over USB uh, using uh, actually just a serial port under the hood. So yeah, that's essentially our bottleneck here. Um, but yeah, when that is done, uh, we will see all the messages coming out here the very first hello from Orboot, then the initialization of the DRAM, so that's the memory that we need, like the eight gigabytes that we have on the board. And here we are, good to go. Now we're loading, uh, well, we're, we're testing DRAM a bit, and then we're loading the next stage. And that is now also coming from, uh, well, that is now coming from the board itself. And now over the network, here we are finally loading a Linux kernel, uh, which has a small initram file system that we can then interact with. For example, using the CPU command, because I also put the CPU daemon in that Linux image. So, um, yeah, one thing I would then uh, want to do, for example, is uh, to say something like, I don't know, cat slash prox slash CPU info. Uh, that is also something we did last time, but we were only seeing a single core. And now, lo and behold, when we run this command, uh, we will now actually see two cores that have come up. So yeah, there should be then two RISC-V cores, uh, both essentially having the same capabilities because they are effectively the same core. Yeah, um, uh, now it's uh, taking a bit of uh, a while, but uh, yeah, here we go. Now we have our feedback, so now we can see there is processor zero, hard zero, and processor one, hard one. Yeah, it, it's not really important currently how we actually count this, uh, but you can see that we have two of those cores and that means we can now actually do multiprocessing over here uh, in our Linux system. Well, we're, we're not actually going to do that right now. Um, and also, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually not going to continue much uh, further now with this SOC uh, because I've essentially decided that, um, well, now that we are at this point, um, you know, it's, it's mostly just some more implementation details. And because this chip isn't even widely produced anymore, we're actually going to move on to another target. But yeah, before we do that, I want to uh, briefly have a look at the uh, tiny thing that I needed to change in our code. So um, yeah, let's look at the boot zero stage. So that's the thing where uh, we do the first initialization and I will now scroll down a bit to the very first assembly instructions that we're running here. And here we are. So the first things that we're doing here is clearing some bits. So essentially there's uh, this here, uh, that is a special thing here on this chip, which is, uh, you know, for some extended features, uh, we're just uh, disabling them here at this point. Um, then we're clearing the uh, interrupt vector and also we disable interrupts and that is now a crucial part that I actually forgot about. Uh, more on that in a bit. Um, yeah, we're clearing the M status register. 
Well, and then we do the suspension of the second heart, which is the one that we're not using for booting up. So the thing is, if we were uh, you know, just running this uh, same code here with both hearts, they would both try to initialize the DRAM, they would both try to write to the yard. As you can imagine, well, <laughs> that doesn't really work out because you know, then you would have like very weird issues. Um, so we only uh, take uh, one of the hearts, uh, let it do all the initialization and then continue. So what we then do is um, uh, we, d we do a bit of a jump here. So we're checking here, we're reading the heart ID and now we're checking if it's actually uh, the zero heart ID. If not, then we continue uh, with this here, the non-boot heart uh, label, which is down here. And otherwise we would just continue regularly and with the other heart, like with the main heart, which we call the boot heart, we would then uh, jump further down to this here. So the boot heart will call the main function and this main function will then do all the initialization and so on. And at some point when we're done, it will have to wake up the other heart. So what is the other heart, the non-boot heart doing in the meantime? Well. First of all, we are enabling again uh, some interrupts. And that is now the important part because enabling the interrupts actually means that we can actually uh, now continue when we receive an interrupt. And that is actually how the two cores are talking to each other. So from the boot hard, I will at some point uh, run something that would then cause an interrupt to arrive at the second hard. And while it's here, just waiting for an interrupt, just you know, keeping spinning, spinning, spinning. When it receives the interrupt, then it will continue and jump to this here, which is the function payload that we have defined further down. And now let's jump to that part. So I will jump to this function now. Um, hang on a second. Oh, right, yeah, it's the exact payload, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a reassignment here. So what does exact payload do? Well, it reads the heart ID again. And now we have it also here in this context. Well, and then we just call the next blob that we continue with. And we pass on the heart ID as the first argument. Well, the second argument is currently just zero. And we're, uh, we're just passing zero here because that is then uh, U-boot, which is taking care of continuing. Um, technically, we don't even need to pass on the hard ID at this point anyway, because U-boot would also uh, be able to read the hard ID because it's still running in M mode, uh, in M mode. but yeah, it doesn't really matter right now. Well, or actually it's uh, technically it's OpenSPI, which is the next step. Anyway, um, so yeah. Uh, so this is how we continue with the second heart. And let's see what we actually do with the boot heart to wake up this one here. So when we're done with our initialization, we arrive at this point here. And what we would then print is run payload. And after run payload, well, we do this here. Um, this is a bit weird. I haven't really figured out why this is necessary. It's also been like this here in the vendor code uh, and somehow it's necessary for U-Boot to be able to use the um, network adapter. I'm not really sure why, but yeah, that's just what it is. Well, and then finally we do this here. I'm printing release second heart and that's how it works. We're using the Clint. So Clint is like the core local interrupt thingy. And there is a bit here in, in this special register called hard one MSIP. MSIP is something something pending, uh, interrupt pending. I'm not sure what the MS was actually. Um, but well, we have a manual where we can look this up. So let's have a look here. Um, it's actually in the, uh, I will have to open this file again. So this is now in the core manual um, that we have. So in, uh, Star 5, version 5.1. Here we get the U74 manual. Um, I think we're actually looking for 
uh, this year U74 Core Complex Manual. So let's search for MSIP. There we go, MSIP register. This is from the core local interrupter, the Clint. And what they are writing here is, MSIP register, machine mode software interrupts are generated by writing to the memory map control register MSIP. Each MSIP register is a 32-bit white wall register um, that essentially is just about how you can write or read to the register where the upper 32 one bits are tied to zero so they don't really matter. It only matters um, what's in the last bit, so the 32nd bit, and that is the least significant bit, is reflected in the MSIP bit of the MIP CSR. So MIP means um, machine mode interrupt pending. And this CSR, well, that is what is then uh, triggering when the, uh, the um, interrupts are enabled, the machine mode interrupts, and that's the MIE uh, that we were setting. Um, well, then, then we would uh, continue from the wait for interrupt that we saw. Other bits in the MSIP register are hardware to zero. Um, that is somehow redundant. Anyway, on reset, each MSIP register is cleared to zero. So yeah, um, software interrupts are most useful for interprocessor communication in multi-heart systems like in ours, right? So we have two hearts or processor cores just uh, called uh, hardware threads in risk five terms. So here we just say multi-heart instead of multi-processor now or multi-core. As hearts may write uh, each other's MSIP bits to effect intraprocessor interrupts. Well, then there is also something on timer re uh, registers, but we don't really care. So this is the thing that we need. And up here in this table, we see the register map for the Clint. And where do we have the MSIP? Well, that would be here. So we have two hearts so that we can use only these two addresses. The other ones are not really applicable to us. That would only be necessary if you like, um, you know, if you have a different uh, SOC with more of those cores here. So yeah, uh, this is now what we're actually doing. So we're, let's go back to the code. We're writing to the MSIP register just a single one. So we're just setting the very last bit. And what will then happen? Well, let's, um, let's actually go back to the start function. So in the start function, we're here at this point, we're at waiting for interrupt. And we have set the MIE, the machine mode interrupt enable register uh, to the value eight. And the eight value, well, um, that is effectively just uh, the one bit that we need here. So in, instead of eight, you could also write this here. It is the, so w we just write a one to uh, one place in the registers. And that would then be the third bit, right? So two to the three is eight. All right. And that is how we continue. So if we now uh, scroll back a bit here and the output, then we can actually see this year where it says run payload and then it says release second heart. And then we continue with the open SBI and you would blob that we loaded from the spy flash. So what do we see here? Um, we see a lot of output apparently. Heart count is two. So yeah, these, uh, this environment here is already checking the number of hearts. Well, it has to because it, as in the same fashion as uh, what we were just doing, it also uh, needs to keep one of the hearts on pause, continue with the other heart. Um, well, well, actually, it actually has to do something with both hearts. So with both hearts, uh, you would now need to um, you know, provide the SBI environment. That is uh, what is happening here. So it's setting up some handlers that the operating system could then just call into. Um, like, for example, to obtain the information of what platform it's running and stuff like that. And, uh, but the output again here can only come from one of the hearts. Otherwise, you know, you would have like duplicate output and uh, very fancy weird effects on the UART, which you don't really want to have. So 
yeah, they also need to know that only one single heart may uh, actually do something. Then it continues with U-Boot, and here it's actually already dropped down into the S node, the supervisor mode of the RISC-V platform. Well, what do we get here? Uh, we get the amount of DRAM, the model name, and so on. And then this here is now trying to load an operating system. And because I've configured that to be the default, it's now going to use DHCP here. It's getting its IP address. And then it's loading something called, well, just ignore this part here. Uh, it's loading something called mImage. And mImage is what is our Linux kernel. Now there is something a bit special about this Linux kernel and I would like to uh, show this. So first of all, well, I have added something to the header of the kernel. So in, in the kernel, there is something called head.s, which is like the first assembly instructions being executed. Um, if, if you want to recap, we've also done this uh, a bit earlier uh, here in the streams. And well, I'm just printing those uh, few characters here. I'm just saying bad, ju just for the fun of it. It could be anything else. I really just want to see uh, a very, very early output from uh, what we're loading here because we actually wanted to be able to load another kernel again from this kernel at some point that hadn't yet worked. So here you see it says Linux version 6.1.0, version 5, and so on. Well, um, it's actually uh, some version 6.2.0. Uh, what do we get when we say uname? Well, um, we also get this here, but yeah, I've, I've actually rebased that onto uh, the latest RC for uh, 6.2, or maybe I'm just mixing things up. Anyway, it's a, it's a fairly recent uh, kernel. And uh, now let's continue. Now we should also see um, that it's finding the second core. So, you know, it would now also use a mechanism to uh, communicate between the cores. And that means we should get something like, yes, I just scrolled past it. Um, might as well just search for it, uh, where, where it says um, multi-core or multi-CPU something. Uh, there, bringing up secondary CPUs and SMP, that is symmetric multiprocessing, says brought up one node, so now we have two CPUs. So yeah, one node was already running. Now it's running the second node. They call it node here. Um, in some contexts, it's CPU. So because Linux is a portable, uh, portable kernel, um, they have to have some more generic terminology. So yeah, here it's now called two CPUs. And that's also why we, we find it in CPU info and not hard info or something like that. So yeah. Um, and now we end up running our CPU daemon again. Um, and so what I can now do is I can also kexec into a new kernel, uh, this one here. Well, you can see it says Linux 6.2 RC, right? And so what I'm now doing is when I run this command, I'm running a second kernel again. Um, but there is a bit of a problem. And let's see what happens now when I run this. So first of all, it will take a while because it needs to transfer the kernel over uh, the ethernet. I know it takes like 10 seconds or so. And then at some point we will get some new output here. Ah, there we go. And it says bye. But it never says hello again. So that is some uh, minor issue still to figure out here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying minor issue currently because well, um, it will be worked out eventually. It's just that I don't really care too much right now uh, because we essentially have our basic kernel running. So that is already a very, very good start. Now let's scroll back a bit to see what actually happened here. So this is where it started. It said kexec image. The entry point of the kernel is at this address. So this is also where uh, we loaded our initial kernel. Uh, kernel. Now it's loading a device tree. The device tree is like somewhere uh, way further in, uh, in the DRAM. And now it's shutting down each and every component of the board. So MMC, for example, the, um, the memory card controller, uh, that is where you, know, you could insert an SD card. 
the I squared C bus is being shut down. Well, apparently there is multiple ones. Um, I don't know what this dummy thing here is at this moment. And well, there's a, a bunch more of other components being shut down. And eventually we get at this point here, takes a core starting new kernel. We're turning off the second CPU. And then it says we will call the new kernel at this address. And well, it says FDT image. So FDT image is the device tree that is somewhere. Um, oh, that's interesting. Should actually more like behind this here, if I remember correctly. Huh, maybe that could already be the issue uh, here. But anyway, so what now happens is technically it should jump to this address, right? So this is where it should have loaded the Linux kernel. And then we should get some output again. And the very least I would want to see is uh, the band that I put at the uh, very front. So yeah, that is already coming from the very first assembly instructions. And I mean, anything else further may uh, fall apart, but I would at least always expect the first assembly instructions to work. But apparently it doesn't work. So yeah, I'm not sure what is going on here, but again, um, I consider this uh, job for now just being done. So we, uh, we will end this chapter here with our development. And I want now to uh, look at a different platform uh, which we're using to continue with. And I already told you, I uh, bought a bunch of boards um, like this one here, the uh, M1S dock. That is something I got from Cyped. Uh, well, it's a tiny box and it's also actually a, a very tiny a little board uh, with a nice case that I have with, um, you know, there is a camera sensor inside and uh, a small display on top of it. Uh, I can actually show that right now. Um, just need to unplug this. So that's this thing here that I also showed a bit earlier in other streams. Well, and there are two USB ports at the bottom here. That's not that clearly visible here. Yeah, I, I will need a bit of a different camera setup for that at some point. Anyway, so there is one USB port which is saying UART where we have a serial interface that we can use directly. So we don't need an, an additional serial converter. And that gives us two interfaces, just like what we are using here. And on the other side, there is something called OTG. So that is uh, another USB port that we can actually then use from uh, whatever this system we would run on this. And what I have also done over the last few weeks is I was playing around with this a bit. Um, there is some example code that uh, Samuel Holland has written. Um, and that is currently just, you know, doing a bit of a hello world. And I took that and uh, rewrote this in Rust. So yeah, based, based on that code and also um, the vendor's code and some uh, uh, information from the manual, I was also able to get some output. So currently, well, it's it's just printing CCC. <laughs> it's not too interesting, um, but I'm glad we got at this point already. And so let's have a look at the data sheet for that one. Or well, rather the manual. Uh, I'm, I'm currently a few pages in here, but let's uh, go back to the beginning. So uh, the chip is from Buffalo Lab, BL808, BL for Buffalo Lab, I guess and it has a few different cores. So we can already see this here. Uh, there are three cores. One is called M0, one is called D0, and one is called LP. This is for low power. D0, uh, D0 is the 64-bit core. Uh, that is a RISC-V core. And M0 is a 32-bit RISC-V core. So essentially we have three entirely different cores. Well, but not that different actually. The M0 core, it's actually a core from uh, the T-Hat Semiconductor Company, uh, that is the E907. And the D0 here is a C906, which is the same that we also have in the uh, D1 SOC from all winner. And let's actually uh, jump to the section here that is describing the CPU. So, well, technically it should be called SOC, uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, what do you do? 
So th they call those cores M0 or, well, also sometimes the um, MCU core, so MCU for a microcontroller unit. And the D0 core is also sometimes uh, just called the application processor or uh, the multimedia processor core. Yeah, let's have a very brief look. Um, they're writing something about the processing pipeline, uh, the decoder and stuff. Uh, it's it really just very rough information here. Um, and uh, let's continue further down uh, here. They're saying uh, which of the RISC five standards are being implemented. So it's the user level ISA in version 2.2 and it's the privileged architecture in version 1.10. And that is also what I know from the D1 from the C906 core. So that is essentially the same. Um, the core local interrupt controller or click 0.8, the external debug support 0.13.2. I've never used that to be honest. I'm not even sure how it works. Well, and then there is something called P, uh, some extension proposal version uh, 0.9. And I think that is uh, how their uh, extended instruction set works or uh, some extended functionality. Um, yeah, but we're not actually dealing with that very much in firmware uh, because that is then for like the operating system to use eventually. So how is it with a D0? Well, about the same thing. Uh, they're describing all the features essentially. Uh, and at some point the implemented standards. And here you can see it's very much the same thing. So it's the user level ISA version 2.2, privilege architecture 1.10. Well, and then they have this here, uh, a vector extension, but this is a, um, well, this is a pre-release version. So the vector extension uh, is, um, let's say, I'm not even sure if there is a final version at this point or something, um, but yeah, th this here was like, uh, one of the versions where, uh, you know, people were saying, well, this is already sort of good to use. So yeah, they, they just went with that uh, at T head and implemented that. And if they wanted to implement the uh, like latest version, you know, they would need to uh, change a bunch of things. So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you develop hardware, it's not that easy to make changes, right? So once the hardware is being manufactured, it is what it is. And if you need to have a different iteration, well, you would need to redesign things and uh, start making new hardware. So it's not as easy to change a software. Anyway, so this is also supporting the uh, external debug something. 0.13.2, I guess it's the same as the other one. Let's have a brief look. 0.13.2, right. So yeah, I, I'm not yet sure what this P thing here is. I haven't really looked into that. Uh, that might be interesting at some point, but then again, yeah, in, in from work, we probably don't need to deal with this. Um, now the low power core, this is also a 32-bit RISC-V core. Uh, and as you can see, it's a much uh, shorter pipeline. So it's just two stages. I think the other one was like four or five stages. So yeah, this, this here is very, very minimal. And so the idea here is uh, it's, it's really just supposed to keep the system up and running. Like, I don't know, when you are on battery and you want to go for another, I don't know, some weeks or months or something. Um, but you know you actually want to suspend most of the system, so you would um, you know you you would just power down the other two cores, uh, yeah. So that is like um, mainly a platform design question. So this here is a chip that is mainly for like IoT applications and stuff, where you would probably have systems that run on battery or something like that. It could also be maybe something that is attached to a car or something which, you know, isn't like constantly running, but, you know, mostly on demand and stuff like that. Or it could be like I don't know, a personal assistant or something. Um, and given that we also have uh, support for stuff like, uh, you know, video encoding, camera and stuff, I don't know, it could be used for a bunch of things. Uh, like, like an assistant for a car, for example, for parking, right? So that is where sometimes people use cameras or I don't know, it could be a dash cam or, you know, some I don't know, security camera at home or something, whatever. So there, there are many applications for uh, this chip. And now let's go further down again, because I want to look at something interesting. Um, and that would be the system architecture. 
let's see if uh, we can find this very quickly. So, okay, here um, we already get the clock tree. So this is how all the clocks depend on each other. And the next interesting part is the bus architecture. So I'm not even sure if it's in this menu or the other one. Mm. I think it's actually covered in the other one. So let's jump over here. Uh, that should be it. Functional description. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, let's look. Ah, right. This is what I was looking for. Now let me make this a bit larger again. So this is now the system architecture. And here we can see how everything uh, comes together. So unfortunately, it's not very colorful, um, but we have these uh, dashes here. And the dashed lines, they are for a single so-called power domain. So this here is for the M0 core that you see here. And then up here, we have the D0 core. And as I was saying, it's also called multimedia. Uh, at some point. But if you look closely, you see that there is this bus here, which is connecting all of those components, but it's also connected down here to this other bus where, you know, we have a bunch more components. And now the question is, can they actually interact with, with each other? And well, Samuel Holland was writing that, um, well, yes, that is possible, but it requires that both of those power domains are actually up and running. So yeah, if you want to use some peripherals from here uh, with the M0 core, it means that you actually need to uh, power up this chip here. So yeah, you would actually have the core running. And well, uh, technically you could also maybe use some mechanism if you, if you don't want to waste anything, you just want to use something from here. Uh, it could be that it's enough to just keep this one here spinning and, you know, maybe wait for interrupt like we did with the uh, other multi hard system now. Um, well, or I don't know, so, something like that. Anyway, um, if, if you look a bit here, uh, it also becomes clear why this here is called multimedia, because here we get things like a JPEG encoder or MJPEG actually, that is motion JPEG for video, that is encoder and decoder. Uh, there's some codec here. I'm not exactly sure what that is. So could be like both video and audio and whatever. And then we have this here, CSI. CSI is like a camera sensor, I think. And then we have, uh, I'm not sure what DVP is. Could be like display, video, processor. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm really unsure about this one. Um, we got VRAM. I think that is for video RAM. Uh, L2 SRAM, I guess that would be for like maybe a level two cache or something. I'm not sure. Um, huh, DVP might be something else again, actually, because here we do have display where it says DSI and DPI and DBI. So DSI, I think, is like the counterpart to CSI. So CSI is for camera something interface and display something interface would be that here. I'm not sure what the P or B is. I guess it's for like different connectors or something with different standards. Oh well, and then we have a bunch of stuff here. There is something called PSRAM here, and that is also very interesting. PSRAM or pseudo SRAM. The pseudo SRAM is actually more like DRAM under the hood, um, but there is a very, very simple hardware controller, so we don't need to initialize very much. And it's almost like having actual SRAM, so static RAM. And this here, uh, in, in this SLC, is 64 megabytes in size. Um, that is something I've uh, very frequently seen already in uh, camera uh, SLCs. So yeah, that is just enough uh, to you know process some images and uh, have a small system that is running here. So yeah, on the other side, we, we have um, all of the fancy peripherals like Everything that is uh, essentially um, like for, uh, you know, networking and uh, stuff like that. So, for example, here we have the eMac, that is the Ethernet adapter. Uh, we have USB. Uh, we, ha we have two DMA things here. Mm. Then we have, well, 
multiple RAM parts. So we have OC RAM, I think that is short for on-chip RAM. W RAM, I think is for maybe like Wi-Fi and stuff, uh, because this is also here. So this chip supports both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, uh, but also on top of that, even Zigbee. So that is a, another radio uh, sort of thing. Um, so you, you can do a bunch of wireless stuff with this only one thing. And well, then we got a bunch uh, more here, like a bunch of UART, SPI, PWM and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not even sure about everything here. So yeah, wh what is very interesting also about this chip, if you look uh, on the website, um, they have partnered up with uh, IKEA, for example, or uh, Amazon also and uh, Google and stuff. So I think they're really like in the IoT market, you know, and trying to, I don't know, uh, make some products with like, uh, I don't know what, like all of this home automation and similar stuff. So yeah, now let's have a brief look at uh, code that we already have for this. And uh, let me find that very quickly. That would be here. And now let me also, um, let me also turn on the uh, serial adapter for it. So I've already connected it here. And now when I power it on, well, you get some output there. Um, that is not actually very meaningful. That is because it's running on a different baud rate than uh, I'm, I'm currently setting this up to be. So let me quickly reset the system. All right. So now it's on hold. Let me clear this. So I want to show you uh, what I have so far. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the make command. And I've been exploring a bit and let's see if we already get some output here. So when I run make, well, as you can see, we're getting C, 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 and now I'm just uh, hitting reset again so it doesn't continue. And there we go. So what we're seeing here is a tool which is very similar to what we're currently using for the Vision 5. It's just slightly different. So this here is a Python script. Um, the output here could be a bit nicer. I've just, I just haven't figured out how to do that yet, uh, as I'm not much of a Python person. It doesn't really matter too much to me anyway. Um, so what is happening here is it's sending over uh, the segments to run on the different cores. So uh, currently this here is only targeting the first core and the first core here is the 32-bit REST5 core, uh, which is the, C9, the E907, so the MCU core or M0. As you can see up here, uh, this is all the configuration that is being printed here. Uh, you know, just to have some verbosity. Um, and up here, again, we see some output from uh, the REST code being compiled. So yeah, th there is a few things I'm currently not using. And uh, well, let's look at the actual code now that we have so far. So yeah, we have this here on the left-hand side. And uh, well, we, we can ignore the other side for the time being. I think this year is uh, so. This year is for the E nine oh seven core. Um, if if we look at this year, uh, oh well. Oh, actually, this is already for the C nine oh six core. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm mixing things up a bit. So yeah, then we actually need to look on the other side. So yeah, this year. So I'm actually experimenting a bit and trying to see if uh, you know I can also get output from the other core. Um, well, so so far I'm not achieving that, but it's uh, yeah I'm not, I'm not yet sure if that depends on the core or something else. So let's let's have a very very brief look here. Um, I pasted a bunch of stuff up here. Uh, which I took from the vendor C code. And, and that C code is actually where uh, they are mostly documenting things. If you look at the manual, it doesn't actually describe the chip directly, but what it does instead is it's describing the functions which are coming from their SDK, which is written in C. So the problem with that is of course, to get an extra understanding of the hardware, we now need to look at the code instead of being able to read things up in the manual. 
and everything that isn't really uh, you know explained too well in the code might be a bit puzzling. So yeah, I'm I'm not sure yet um, how to proceed with that, but yeah, I'm I'm trying to make the best out of it. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, the GPIO pins they can be configured to be many many different functions like I squared C for example, um, SPI up here. Uh, here we have UART. That is something we're actually using. And now here is the interesting part. Uh, there is a different configuration for using the MMUART, so that is for the multimedia core. And for that, let's have a brief look at the system here again. So we're talking about this here, multimedia, uh, multimedia this uh, region up here. And here we have one UART, which is, you know, very, very special to this core here. And now down here, it says UART uh, and then three. So there is three UARTs uh, on, on this bus here. And technically, we should be able to also use this UART at some point if we power up both of these uh, cores. But yeah, I haven't really figured this out fully, but I find this interesting that these uh, yeah, are the capabilities. And it also depends a bit on um, like which pin you use, what functionality you have available and so on. So this here is not actually fully generic. It's just like partially generic and partially applies to either pin or core or whatever. It, it's a bit complicated. So that is something still to figure out. So here is a bunch of consents I have defined so far. Um, GLB, that is like uh, some global whatever system configuration. So that includes the UART configuration. Um, there is something SWRST that is software reset. So that is how we can reset the system. Uh, and then we have uh, the GPIO configurations for each and every pin. So we're currently using uh, two of those pins here uh, for one UART and two for the other UART. And now if we want to figure out what pins we're using, well, uh, we take a look at the schematics and these are the schematics to our board. So let's quickly zoom out a bit here. So this is the system on a chip that we're using. Uh, well, this is actually the system on a, a module. So the system on a chip is down under the shield here. And now it's put on a module like this here, which has an antenna. And well, there, there is a bunch of other stuff uh, down here as well, but we can actually see that. Now that in turn is put on top of this board here. And this board is inside of the case that I was showing earlier where I have, you know, the display attached and everything. So yeah, that is just in, inside of our case. And then the peripherals are, well, only the two USB uh, connectors that we have. Um, there is another special connector that we have, which has four pins. Um, can we actually find that here? Let's have a brief look. Oh, well, um, we, we do find a, a bunch of things here. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure actually. So yeah, there, but yeah, there is uh, a four pin connector. Could actually be this one here, which is like IO 26 and 27. And it looks like it's also uh, just grounded somewhere. I'm not. I'm not sure even. Now yeah, we'll, I will need to figure that out. Um, well, and then let's scroll up again because this is actually what I mainly wanted to look at. This here. So this here is what is routed to the um, USB chip that is uh, for um, getting us the two serial ports. So. Here you can see there is TX and RX, and again, TX and RX, uh, and RTS and DTR. Um, they do not really matter that much to me right now. So what we are already using is this here, IO 14 and 15 from the E907 core. Uh, this is what we configure to be RX and TX. And we actually have to do this now that way because it's just hardwired on the board and it goes straight to uh, this one chip that we're using for getting uh, the serial port. And in the same fashion, we also have these two here, IO 16 and 17. And so that is why I'm defining exactly those here, 14, 15, 16, and 17. 
well, and technically um, there are a few more, but those are uh, the ones which are interesting right now. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to configure um, the second UART, UART1, to actually end up on uh, these two pins here. So let's also have a brief look at how that works. So just like uh, for uh, just like for our Vision 5 board, uh, we have some assembly code that we start with in the beginning. So what what do we hear? Uh, what do we do here? Well, we disable our interrupts. We clear the M status register. Um, we do a bit of setup for the stack and the BSS, and then we jump to our main function. And now in the main function, it's really just these few instructions here. We just set up some GPIOs and uh, we try to get some output from the UART. Um, and this is how we just get C, 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 uh, because it's just running in a while loop, which is just writing to a register. And then, uh, well, this is saying sleep here currently, but uh, what the sleep function is doing is really just, you know, spinning for, I don't know, a, a bunch of instructions so that it's like effectively like, uh, you know, sleeping for a second or two. Um, so yeah, this is why you, you didn't see like C, 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 C being spammed, but you saw like C, 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 slowly one after another. But yeah, that is good enough for our output. So as you can see here, I'm also trying to print A, and I'm trying to print A on the uh, second UART here. And now let's have a very brief look at uh, the setup. So we can split this up a bit. So up here, this is actually some uh, like common configuration that we're passing to um, both sets of pins. And then we do this here with both pins. So I'm saying the configuration to be a TX UART. So TX is the transmit part. Um, that means we need to set two uh, flags. So there is one for, you know, actually being a UART, the UART function. And then there is one for output mode. And well, those are very simple bits just being defined here. So there is one for output mode. Um, now there is one for pull up and one for input mode. Those here, so yeah, these are um, uh, the lines that are going in. Uh, we're currently not using them, but yeah, I'm, I'm just saying the, them up because Samuel also did that. And uh, well, maybe, uh, Maybe we can do something with that at some point for experimenting a bit. Um, yeah, it's it's not too, that doesn't matter too much right now. So what else do we have? Um, we have this GPIO fun UART and let's see where that comes from. So that is defined up here and it's really just setting this bit number seven. Uh, well, it's, it's writing a, a seven to eight this way. Okay, so seven, um, so I, I tried to figure this out from uh, the vendor code. So the vendor code says um, these uh, bits from eight to, I think from eight to 11, uh, those are the bits that you need to set for uh, getting a specific function. Or it could even be like eight to 12 or something. So it's, it's quite some bits. Actually, it makes sense to have like eight to 12 because it can go above 20, right? So you would need to have at least five bits for this year. So yeah, this is again just um, the same as here, right? So it's the value seven uh, that is being put in one register. So what does the register then look like? So if we look at one of those um, GPIO registers, um, let's draw a bit here. So at some point we have our pin, uh, our, our bit 31, we have bit 30, we have been bit 29, 28, 27, 26, four, uh, 25 and now let's continue with the next line so the next line would be uh, pin uh, or bit 23 22 21 and 21 so and uh, well now we get to this part where uh, we have this um, configuration that we're talking about here. So that would be here then 12, 9, no, hang on, 12, 
10, 11, 10, <laughs> too stupid to count today, uh, 9, 8, and now the last ones, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and the last bit. All right, now let's um, put this here in like a comment section. And now let's fill this up again. So uh, first of all, I would like to expand this a bit more. So I will just, um, I will replace everything here, which is like, uh, I'll replace two spaces with like, uh, let's say four spaces like this. Is four nice? Yeah, I think that's a good start. And then I want to have a bit of a split here, maybe. I don't know, maybe like this. Um, I don't know. Uh, so now we can uh, document this here a bit. So we make some uh, empty lines here. And so what we're looking at now is we're looking at 132 bit register. And now in this space here, so from bit 12 to uh, bit number eight. So this region here essentially, uh, let's do it like this. So this is like the GPIO function or mode. So that would be here. Maybe like this. I don't know. This is ASCII art drawing. Okay. So what else do we have? Um, we have bit number zero. So zero would be the last bit here. And as we as we said, so bit zero is uh, for this here for input. Um, let's actually let's actually start here. So this here would be for output. Number four would be for pull up. Zero would be for input like this and so on. So yeah, this is essentially um, how we can uh, now understand uh, how this register works. Now, the problem is um, depending on the actual uh, GPL register, it might be that only certain of those functions or modes are actually supported. So we, we need to figure out which ones those are. And uh, it looks like well, the best way to do that is um, by, you know, uh, looking at the vendor code again. So yeah, um, that's that. And uh, now let's continue a bit with the code. So yeah, now we're assigning the uh, UART functions. Now the next thing we're doing here is this year, um, we're loading a uh, certain configuration. So there's a UART configuration uh, register. And let's see where that came from. So that was here. So this is not the GPO configuration now, this is the UART configuration. And well, um, we're, we're setting this up here for uh, uh, this year. Uh, we're, we're setting bit number four. And what is bit number four actually? Um, well, I've actually commented that um, on the other side here, which is uh, the code intended to run on the second core. And uh, yeah, this is for enabling the UART clock. Oh, we, we actually also have this here. Sorry, I just put the comment in the wrong place. So yeah, uh, this is for enabling the UART clock. And uh, let's actually see if... Um, Maybe uh, we need to um, maybe we need to do a bit more here for uh, being able to use both uh, UARTs. So how do we do this? Um, well, we look at the uh, this here. This here is the C code from the vendor, so they have some SDK, right? 
Let me quickly print the path here. So this is the SDK that I got from uh, just SciPeed and then M1SBL808 SDK on GitHub. And so as you can see, I already searched uh, for a bunch of things here in the code. Um, and now I would like to figure out how this um, uh, how this clock configuration works. So we're searching for um, UART CFG0 or, well, that is GLB base plus 150 in hex. So now the problem is if we search for something like 150, uh, we may find a bunch of occurrences which are not that intuitive. But we're already here in this file, uh, glbrec.h. So this should be defining all the uh, register is here. So let's see if we can actually find something if we only search for clock. Well, we don't. How about CLK? Ah, there we go. So we have, um, well, we have hex 250, but we're searching for uh, hex 150. Oh, and there we go. So we're in this space now. And well, what do we have? We have UART clock enable. And that is bit number four. That is exactly the bit that we're setting here. Now there is also something called UR2IO select. I'm not sure what that is supposed to be. Um, but we're also seeing this here, uh, HBN UR clock select and HBN UR clock select two. So those two here. It's a good question what those are. Now the problem is this is actually not covered in the manual. So if we, uh, if we search for this here, we, we can just search for this here in the manual. Um, so that would be either here. Let's see if we find this here. We don't. Do we find this here? Oh, well, um, we actually do find it here. Interesting. So this is the uh, clock source. So yeah. Um, just uh, to elaborate a bit, so there is a bunch of things which uh, you know you would not find here in the manual. Um, and yeah, here, here in this case, we are a bit lucky. So, yeah, as you can see, we can only find this here. Uh, we don't find uh, UART uh, clock select two. Uh, what does it say here? The UART clock sources include XCLK, a one hundred and sixty megahertz clock, and BCLK. So that is also what we see here. The frequency divider in the clock is used to divide the clock source and then generate the clock signal to drive the UART as shown below. Well, that looks rather simple. So we can select which of those clock sources we want to use. And well, at some point we can also configure a divider. So do we see the divider in the code here? Um, well, we have this here. There is your clock divider, and apparently that's a three-bit field. Uh, I think this is the bit count. So here it's two for six and five. Here it's from eight to twenty-one. That would be fourteen. Yep. Okay. This year, uh, this year is the size in bits. That makes sense. Um, and I guess this year is the default value. So your clock enable should by default actually be set to one already. So we don't really need to do that. Um, yeah, there's some bits which uh, are saying reserved. And it looks like the UART clock selection is a read only bit. So yeah, it's, it's only saying R, it's not saying R slash W, which would be read write. So yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that is uh, correct like that because it seems a bit weird, but um, yeah, maybe it's also just reflecting something and you can actually select the clock source somewhere else or something. I'm not sure. It's it's a bit weird. Anyway, um, yeah, what else do we have? There is a second UART configuration register and the third. So there is this here, uh, UART SIG 0, SIG 1, SIG 2, and so on. Um, I'm not exactly sure what those are supposed to mean. Uh, but they are all four bit values each. And uh, well, you, you can set them to zero, one, two, three, four. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure what that is supposed to mean. So let's, let's see if we can find uart sig in the manual again. So do we find this? Uh, not in here apparently, but I'm almost sure that we could find it here. Right. So here, we see this here, uart sig, and then depending on the value here, uh, we get a certain functionality, but um, yeah, it's, it's a bit weird because there is also like other things. <laughs> so if, if you set this um, uart value to seven here, then it also depends on what uart sig is set to so that you could also uh, assign a specific uart uh, functionality pin. So that's a bit weird. Um, let's actually see if we find uh, if we find the UART one. So, and we want to have that on a specific GPA open. Let's see if we can find that again. So 15, 16, 17, I think 16. Yeah, 16 is the one that should be the TX pin. So let's uh, scroll up here a bit. Um, I'm searching for where this column here says 16. As you can see, this here is not the easiest thing to work with. It's, it's a bit confusing. Um, and I guess that is much further up. So this here is a very, very long data sheet. Uh, here we are. So this is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Okay. So in order to have UART 1 TX, we need to set you are six five to six. Okay, so um, let's do that. Uh, so actually, I have this constant defined for that. Um, so we need to set you are six five to the value six. So I have the value six here and uh, I'm shifting it by 20. Is that correct though? Huh, look, you're at six, six. It's actually not at 20, it's at 24. So this here should be 24. Interesting. And I guess this here then should be like 28. Well, um, let's see if that already solves the problem now. Well, apparently it doesn't because we're not getting the A on the other side. Uh, whoops. Okay, so let, let's see if we get this right. So UART1 should be TX. UART1 should be TX. We need to have the value 6, and we need that to be in UART6 six, SIG5. UART6, oh, I actually had this right. So this should have been 20. Okay, so let's revert the changes here. I'm sorry, this is so confusing. Uh, it, it's really hard for me to uh, do this already when I'm concentrated now when I'm doing this live it's uh, not getting any better but well at least you can now see what I'm fighting with here so apparently um, the initial value here would be 5 and I'm now setting this to 6 this year I think it's correct I think it's correct well, and for, uh, well, we can also cross check. So with um, GPIO 17, in order to have that be the UART 1 RX, I would set SIG, SIG 7 to uh, SIG 6 <laughs> to the value 7. Uh, I'm setting the value 7, and SIG 6 should be starting at 24. That is here. Okay, so far, so good. Um, so yeah, that part looks like it's correct, at least to my eyes right now. 
So that was the um, that was the so all of the above here is for like the um, GPIO and uh, UART configuration. Now there's something special here. Um, there is a register called URTX, and this is now from a different block. So um, this year, uh, URTX CFG, I'm configuring uh, the parameters of the UART. So like the stop bit, uh, the length of a word. Uh, there is something called free run mode, apparently uh, that can be just enabled. At least that's also in the example code. And then we are uh, actually enabling uh, the TX so that we can actually transmit something. So yeah, this makes sense to definitely have it set. So that is already working uh, for UART0 and it should also work for UART1. So let's have a brief look here. So what is UART0? Um, UART0 is at this address here, two, three zeros, then A and three zeros. And if we look at this manual here, there should be a memory map somewhere where we should find that value. Uh, but maybe not here, but in the other manual. Come on, um, did I get this wrong? To, oh, hang on. Oh, right. Um, it's probably not written with an underscore. So yeah, here we go. And here we actually have something which is a bit different. So here we actually have a documentation of those uh, registers. So unlike with the GPL registers, which are only uh, sort of documented in the code, um, we actually have the configuration here. So here um, we actually see the individual bits and we see this bit here, the last one bit zero is the uh, TX enable bit. So U for UART TX enable bit. Um, I guess CR is for control something. I'm not sure actually. Doesn't really matter too much anyway. So it's saying uh, asserting this bit will trigger the transaction and should be deasserted after finish. That is interesting. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe we need to write something um, to the output register first and then set this bit here. It could be. I'm not sure because it sort of works with the, um, with the other UART and essentially we're doing the same thing now. But let's actually see if we got the other base address right. So this year, 2000A100. Well, this is where it says the UART1 should be. So yeah, this here is again the um, a memory map. So we looked at memory maps before. And uh, actually we, we have skipped this one here so far. So let's have a very brief look at this here. So here we essentially see the same thing that we also saw in the architecture earlier. So we have the um, different areas. So one is this here. These are all the peripherals for the multimedia core, the D0 core. And down here, we have all the peripherals for the MCU core. So it says MCU peripherals, uh, Perry is just shortening. Um, and that continues down here. So yeah, we should be able to just use both the UART0 and UART1 uh, when we are coming here from the MCU. Yeah, apparently um, UART1 is not outputting anything yet so far because otherwise we would see it down here. Now there is one thing um, we may actually need to set, uh, which I haven't really set yet. And that would be um, the bot rate. So do we, do we find this here? Do we find like bot or something? Um, well, we don't, at least not in here. Uh, it might be that this is actually in a different file. So let's see if we have something like a GPIO header file. Huh, interesting. So do we find something like, oh no, so uh, we're, we're looking for UART. So there is UART direct 
A0 and there is UR drag. I'm not sure what the A0 would be. Let's look at UR drag. Um, do we find bot? No, we don't. Uh, do we find it? Um, like just AUD. Do we find the 115 200 that we want to use? No, we don't. What do we actually have in this file here? Um, sorry, I just shrunk that in the wrong direction. Okay, so yeah, there is a ton of things which are being defined here, as you can see, and it's not really that comprehensible if you don't really know what all of this means. Um, but let's have a look. So there is UTX config, which is this here. Um, oh, hey, we may actually, oh, let's actually not have to deal with this uh, code here because we saw this, um, we saw the section where uh, they're actually documenting the um, registers here for the UART. So let's see if we also have the uh, bot rate somewhere. Because it should be able to set the bot rate anyway. Um, I mean, so far we're getting no output. So I, I'm I'm not sure if we um, if we would actually get any output if we just have the default bot rate. But I would, to be honest, I would actually expect that to be the case. So we should at least get some like weird garbage, uh, just like we saw from. Um, when I'm booting it up, not with our own co uh, code loaded, but you know, when I just hit reset and then we saw some garbage there. So what do we have here? Um, period related to bot rate. Okay, that is interesting. Um, so what is the default value? Uh, reset value would be 16 and 16. And I would guess that, that to be the uh, default for both initially. Mm data config okay uh, bit inverse signal for each data byte lsb first msb first uh-huh stop position and start okay so this is not for infrared that doesn't really matter to us uh, some timer some other mode again the interrupt mass so we're not using interrupts anyway Clearing the interrupts, enabling the interrupts, your status. Um, that is something we will definitely need to look at. Um, like, actually, we, we shouldn't send uh, another character when the uh, TX bus is currently busy. Uh, that would be this year. But it doesn't really matter for, uh, you know, if we're just getting started. We just want to send out one stupid character now to actually see that it's working. Um, Auto bot rate detection. Interesting. Interesting. So the default value is zero. Uh, sixteen. Sorry. No, it's actually, it's actually zero. So it's a sixteen-bit value, and it's reset to zero. I was reading this wrong earlier. I think. Yeah, we should look again at the bot rate thing. What do we have here? Another auto bot rate detection thing. Oh, maybe you can trigger something that would automatically detect the baud rate or something? Huh. The thing is, um, they're not exactly describing how that thing works. Apparently there's like four registers for just getting some baud rate automatic configuration or something. PWTOL. Uh, tolerance, okay. Uh, BCR count. Mm. I don't know. Could be like BCR bot rate configuration register. Maybe that is related to something uh, for the auto configuration. It could be. Oh well. Uh, then there is a bunch of other stuff. Like the behavior for the FIFO and blah. And this here. So this here is now the actual data that we want to send out. So the last eight bits here, uh, you are FIFO W data or write data, I guess. Um, that is the uh, output that we're writing. So that is already what we have in our code so far. 
if we look at this here, um, there. So we're writing our character, in, in this case a C, to the W data register. That is what works so far. And well, that's already the end of this chapter. So let's get back to what we just saw um, about the baud rate settings. So I want to see what it says. So the user can set the register uh, to generate the required baud rate. The high 16 bits and low 16 bits of this register correspond to Rx and Tx respectively. Okay. So they can be set separately. Well, um, the 16 bits value is calculated by the following, form uh, following formula. Okay, now it's getting interesting. The baud rate is the UART clock over 16 bit width factor plus one. That is a 16 bit width factor equals UART uh, your clocks over baud rate minus one. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they just uh, swapped around the equation here. So we need to uh, take our baud rate. In our case, that would be 115 to 100 minus one and use that as the divisor uh, for the UART clock. And that would give us the factor here. This factor means the count value obtained by counting the bit width of the current baud rate with the UART clock. Since the maximum factor is 65535, six, the minimum baud rate supported by UART is UART clock over, well, it's about 64K. Interesting. Um, before sampling the data, UART will filter the data to remove the bursts in the waveform. Okay, and the data will be sampled at the intermediate value. Okay, let's just do the following. Um, let's see. Let's see what baud rate we have uh, for each of those registers. So let, let's see again what the... Um, what's the register again for the baud rate setting? Uh, there is also some comments on the transmitter and the free run mode. If free run mode is disabled, ah, this is where you have to have um, this TX EBIT re enabled and disabled and so on. Mm -hmm. And in free run mode, we, we can just keep running and keep printing. Okay, that is good. So the baud rate register is, um, which one? Bit period of auto baud rate detection, no. Uh, data config, bit PRD. Okay. The period of each URTX and RX bit. So let's read this register here. So your bit PRD, if you want to call it that. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, so bit PRD is a U size and the Offset was just eight. Okay, so we do the same here for the other UART. So that would be for UART zero. And now I want to read this. Um, now this is a 32 bit register, right? And we can only output eight bits at the time for now. Uh, so we are just going to hack this a bit. Um, so we say that whatever, I would just call it B0 now. We say read volatile uh, as star mute U32.
and we do this twice so for uh, both of these and now we want to output this and we're going to output this to uh, well we're going to output to the first word because that is already working and so we say b0 here and then we shift b0 by 8 right because uh, we now want to uh, read the next eight bits and now the question is which is which so tx so this is the lower 16 bits so let's write that up here uh, lower 16 bits are for tx oh, and that comment goes down here Baud rate configuration. Okay, so let's do this for both actually. So we do this for B0 and B1. But we we'll still print to the same UART, right? So I want to see if they are configured differently. So let's uh, just run the code again. Oh, wow, some stupid bot is coming here and offering shit in our chat. Um, we want to ban this. Uh, how do we ban this here? I don't know, actually. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, whatever. Um, I guess I would need to do that on the Twitch platform. Anyway. So we got something. And uh, let's actually see what we got. And I already reset the board. So we get B4, O2, and here we get FF and 00. zero. Uh -huh. Let's write this down. So here we have B402 and here we have FF00. So what we're doing now is we're writing a different value and that value would be B1 and well, we just uh, cleared the last bits. Um, hang on. Uh, is that correct? And then we would say. Uh, B402, B402, let's see if we get the, that we get the order right, okay, so first, first we're outputting the last two, and then the first two, okay, so this is actually OOFF, and this is O2B4, okay, so let's get the order right here. So actually, this is the order O to B4. So I'm not sure if this is too low or something, um, but it could be. Anyway, um, so okay, now I would need to would need to focus a bit again. So. How do you clear? Oh. Right. 
Right. That should be it. Let's see if this works and we actually get something and well, no, we don't. Whoopsies. Okay. I just reset again. So that's, um, doesn't look like it's working because I was expecting to see like, okay, let's get up here because that is from like the regular boot now. Um, Okay, so we just saw C, 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 C. We didn't see the A's on the other side, right? So now we see B4, O2, F, F, O, O. Um, well, we can just read back the value again and see if it's now the same. Uh, and we actually do have that um, nice value that we want to have. So we would need to do that either way. Right, so let's see what we get now. Okay, that looks good actually. So we get our, oh, look, now it's B502 and here it's B402. Huh, interesting. Um, yeah, even, even if that is not uh, perfectly accurate right now, it should be sort of okay enough. So I guess the, the um, the current bot rate is uh, being calculated by the Maskrom. So the Maskrom already, uh, you know, communicates uh, with our tool actually, and that is on 115200 bots. So technically we don't need to set up too much right now. Uh, we could also get away with, um, you know, doing only half of the setup up here. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, that is not yet uh, what we want, but um, I guess we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, I, I will see what else I can figure out. Anyway, um, we're already almost 90 minutes in now. So what I want to do now is uh, finish up uh, the stream by uh, just saying thank you very much for uh, listening in and uh, following through uh, with all the development that we've done so far and for um, continuing uh, with this chip here, uh, I will start a new chapter. I will make some new announcements and maybe I will also just pick some uh, different point in, uh, point in time or uh, maybe I will also step away from a regular schedule because um, yeah, there were not really uh, many people tuning in here anyway. Um, yeah, I, I will see how that works out and it might be that um, I don't know, maybe I will just uh, start again in a month or something. Um, there is a bunch more things coming up right now. For example, there is a FOSDEM, uh, which is going to take place in like a month. And uh, yeah, a bunch of other events I'm already excited for. And uh, yeah, then we will see that we start another uh, Orbit hacking chapter and I will ap update all the playlists and everything uh, accordingly. So yeah, thank you very much. Take care and see you some other time.